What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe you are just here to see how Telemachus gets on his little journey to go find his dad. Well then this is not only the video for you but this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But onto the topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be going into book two of Homer's Odyssey. So if I could summarize book two of the Odyssey into one sentence, which I do, I did it throughout my entire Iliad series did it last episode people seem to like it so if I could do it into one sentence it would be that Telemachus gets bullied by all of the suitors and then he leaves that is pretty much exactly what happens and he leaves for good reason not only did a goddess tell him to leave but also because the suitors again they are just rude to him why would you want to be around that but you'll be seeing a very good example of why they are rude and how they are rude throughout this book so why don't we just dive into the narrative so that you guys can really understand what the hell that sentence means so last time in book one i left you with telemachus going to bed right Eurycleia like hangs up his little coat on his his hook his shirt not his coat hangs up his shirt on his little hook by his bed leaves him he then sleeps right so book two picks up right off the next day okay he wakes up he gets himself ready he then runs into these heralds when he leaves his room and he tells the heralds to call an assembly to call everybody to this assembly and again if you remember from book one he had told all of the suitors when they were all having dinner that he was going to call this assembly so this is not news to us this is not news to anybody in the book so the heralds gather not only the suitors but also all of the lords and all of the grown men from the island to come to the island of Ithaca that's where they are uh, to this assembly to talk to Telemachus even though they don't actually know that Telemachus called it just yet they're just saying hey there's a meeting and everybody's like uh, I guess okay so they're all in the hall and Telemachus then strides in last and he strides in I love this image with these two hounds on either side of him you know what people use this all the time in pop culture and as far as I'm aware this is one of the first times that it's written down as like an image of like somebody flanked by two scary hounds like that is is how he's entering in front of all of these men right this is probably one of the youngest men if not the youngest man in this meeting and he's coming in with everything really to show off his power and not only that but Athena notices this and so Athena also infuses him with this like great splendor and, and basically makes his aura like super important so everybody else can feel it like like this godly godly coming off of him basically and they're all like hmm okay Telemachus is looking slightly different today and so they all actually part ways when he comes in they part ways they make a path for him so that he can easily walk from one end of the hall all the way through to sit in his dad's seat that's also important to show off how important Telemachus now looks and remember that he looks exactly like Odysseus apparently so this is like a very big moment for him also quickly on the hound thing I think that even Madison Beer did it in a music video didn't she I swear to god like everyone does it but I think this is the first time it's written don't quote me on that <laughs> it might have popped up slightly before this maybe Egyptian times or Persian I don't really know someone let me know in the comments but I think Telemachus is the first dude to look this badass. So the first man to speak is actually not Telemachus, surprisingly. He sits down and some old guy stands up in the meeting and actually we find out that he has four sons, this man. So four sons, one of them went to Troy with Odysseus, but he won't make it home. Homer tells us now that he actually was the last man to be eaten by Polyphemus, the Cyclops. You'll understand that when we get to that episode because we do have that explained. But so he died there, right? He's not making it home. He then has two other sons who then stay and they farm at home. Basically, they're really boring. And the last son is actually one of the suitors in the palace for Penelope. So this is the man who stands up. And apparently when he stands up, he's already got like tears in his eyes. And he says that they haven't had a meeting like this. They haven't had an assembly like this since before Odysseus left. So that's like 20 years ago since all of them were in the same room. This island is not that big. I don't know why somebody hasn't called a meeting just in general. Like why have none of them been like, well, we should probably call a meeting and talk about it. So it's been 20 years since they've done this. No wonder you'll see none of them know how to speak to each other. And he basically just says to them that he's, he's wondering who called the meeting, right? He wants to know who called them and for what motive. So that's when Telemachus stands up from his seat and one of the heralds hands him a staff, right? This is a thing in Homeric writing, it was a thing in the Iliad as well, that when they would want to speak, they had this like really nice staff that they would be given. So now Telemachus stands up with his staff and he says to all of them, I'm the one that called the meeting, it was me. And explains to all of them that it's not a public service announcement, that they're not just there to chit chat. He's not telling them of like some foreign thing. No, they are all there to discuss the travesty that is happening in the palace currently. And he explains the suitor situation, which bear in mind, half of them are there. Well half the people who were in the meeting, all the suitors are there. But half the people standing in front of him are the suitors. And he's like, it's all of you 
fucking up my life currently and overrunning the palace when it's against even his mother's will. He's like, even my mum doesn't want you there and yet you guys won't leave. Telemachus tells the other men in the meeting, he says that if these suitors were so important and so well respected and so wonderful as they seem to make themselves out to be, shouldn't they go straight to Penelope's dad if they really want to marry her and ask for her hand in marriage from him and not just sit in the palace and take all their food and take all their wealth and just hang the f out and basically make his life a, a living hell even. Watch me stumble over those words because I talk far too quickly. But obviously they're not that respectable. They're not that great if they're not doing those things. And Telemachus says before anybody can ask that he can't be the one to kick them out single handedly because he's not of age and he was not a man who was ever in battle. So he says, I don't have the skills nor do I have the authority in order to do that effectively. And if he were to do that, then he would just accentuate his weakness. And this is something that I really love about Telemachus in this moment, that he wants to do a lot of things, but he understands his limitations given the predicament that he's in and the age that he's in. He's not being unrealistic. He's not standing up in front of them being like, I'm super tough and I just came into manhood and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you all what to do. Like he's not doing any of that. He's very much saying, I would like your help. I want all of you to help me get rid of these suitors because I can't do it alone. Because they're not gonna listen to me if I try to do it alone. I don't know what I'm doing if I do it alone. He says that the only man who could do it single-handedly would be Odysseus, that he's the only man with the power, the only man with the authority, the only person that they would take seriously is his dad. But he does say that the suitors should be hella embarrassed by the way that they're acting. He's like, this is disgraceful. And in fact, Telemachus himself is praying to Zeus and to Themis uh, to have them on his side. And he says that if they decide to stay, if they want to stay in the palace, he says, that's fine, but it's going to bring about your downfall. So basically stay at your own risk. He said this in book one as well. He's reiterating it again now. And in fact, he's so worked up by the end of the speech and he's so overwhelmed with emotion that he's like crying, he's angry. I feel like everybody has been that level of angry at one point or the other in their life where they're just like crying and they're like, ah, I can't do this. And he just throws down his scepter on the ground and it reminds me of Achilles in book one of the Iliad because he throws down his scepter after yelling at Agamemnon and thinking that he's utterly ridiculous. And Telemachus does this right now. He throws down his thing and he sits down and he's like crying. Now all the men in the assembly take pity on Telemachus, right? They all feel really bad for him in this moment. He's crying, he's clearly really angry, he's very frustrated. I mean, everybody except for this one dude called Antinous, because Antinous decides that now he's gonna speak up. And he gets up and he basically, again, he reiterates the same as book one, how Telemachus is now being all high and mighty and it's not done in <laughs> a nice way. Like they're not being like, wow, you're so powerful now and you're so grown up. They're like, hey, what the f man, where did this come from? In fact, he says to Telemachus, how dare you attempt to blame us for all of these problems? You should be blaming your own mother, which is shocking. But he then says one of my favorite lines in the entire thing, because he describes Penelope as a matchless queen of cunning. That line is, uh, line 95, right? That is one of my favorite lines in the entire book about Penelope because I think it's just a perfect way of describing how she is. Even though he says it in a bad way, I think it's such a complimentary line. <laughs> it's now we get one of the most famous stories about Penelope there. And it's about how he says that for three or four years that she's actually been playing with all of the suitors, that she has been totally messing with their hearts and giving them false hope and dangling things in front of them and making them believe that they have a chance with her, even though the whole time she's been thinking about somebody else, right? This is three to four years that she's been doing this. If that's the case, she's a little bit psychotic, but I don't think that that's, <laughs> just listen to the story. So he tells us that apparently one day Penelope decided that she was going to start weaving, right? So she brings down her loom into this great hall and she's like, oh guys, I can't talk to you. All of the suitors, I can't actually have a conversation and get to know you and because I don't really want to. And also because I am currently going to weave this huge shroud. That's what she decides. She's going to weave this entire massive shroud and she tells them that it's for Laertes, who is her father-in-law, right? So Odysseus's father. And she says that she's now going to be weaving this shroud for him in case he dies. Because if he dies and he doesn't have a shroud, then everybody's gonna feel really bad for him because what are they gonna cover his body with? And so it needs to be this really beautiful shroud that she's going to start weaving for him like now, prematurely. And this is why I think it's so funny because it's sort of like when people now, when they joke about buying their grandparents like coffins when they're rude to them, but it's like they're still alive and it's just like a really dark thing to do. That's essentially what Penelope's doing, that she's like, yes, Laertes is not on his deathbed yet, but I'm going to weave this thing just in case he is because he's really old, you know? <laughs> it's just such a slap in the face to Laertes. So she does this, right? She weaves this massive shroud for Laertes and it takes her a really long time, right? Like she's weaving all day, every day, for three years. And the suitors believe her. They don't even question her. Not once. They kind of come in to check on her, but she's still busy working. So all of them respect her. 
until in the fourth year, one of her maids actually tells the suitors that actually Penelope is going in at night and unweaving everything that she's woven the first day, which is why this thing is taking her so long because she's weaving and then unweaving and then weaving and then unweaving and then weaving and then unweaving just because she doesn't want to talk to these men. So I'm like, is she really flirting with you guys all that much? <laughs> it's questionable. Now the suitors are so mad when they heard this that apparently they went and they caught her in the act in the middle of the night. They catch Penelope unweaving her loom. Imagine how awkward that would have been for Penelope in pitch blackness and all of a sudden these guys coming in being like what are you doing it's her house bear in mind and they've come in to check if she's unweaving what she's woven and so what they end up doing is they end up forcing her against her will to finish this this shroud that she's doing and it doesn't take her that long but they force her to do it so that she doesn't have that excuse anymore which i think is rude but okay so in telling us this story antonis says how the f do you think it's our fault that you have all these problems it's clearly her fault and if she really didn't want to marry any of us then you telemachus should send her back to her father icarius and he will pick uh, a new husband for penelope that's what he says he says it's not our job it's not your job it is actually Penelope's job to go back to Icarus and then that way she can get a new husband because he says that none of them are going to leave until she is remarried which is ridiculous because again it's not the house though he does give Penelope a lot of compliments throughout this speech he does say that there's no queen who has ever been written about ever been told that there's anything remotely like Penelope that apparently she is just another caliber of woman she is smart she apparently is just like incredibly fun to be around she has these subtle wiles like all of this stuff that apparently Athena gave her like her amazing weaving right that's a gift that Athena gave her and supposedly she just no other woman rivals Penelope like they are all completely infatuated by her and that's why they're not leaving and that's why it's her fault which again that sounds more like a suitor problem then it does Penelope's problem. And I always wonder when I read this speech because that he just sort of ties it off at the end by basically saying that they're not gonna leave and he doesn't really give a shit what Telemachus says. But I always think, how much was Penelope actually flirting with you? And did she maybe, maybe just compliment one of your shirts one day and you thought that was her flirting with you? It is notable because she hasn't told them to leave yet. And Telemachus does also say that, that she hasn't told them to leave, which I think we should hang on to. However, it doesn't seem like she's making any active moves to flirt with them. If she's willingly going to weave and unweave something for three whole years and I do want to highlight that to everybody right now. Telemachus though stands up and he's super calm now, he stopped crying and he says a very valid point and he looks right at Antonis and he says how am I supposed to send the woman who gave me birth back to her father and he he does go on but i feel like he could stop there and like all of us would agree like yeah she literally birthed you and raised you why would you just send her home but he does continue and actually makes even more good points that's just a very good opening argument and he says that nobody knows whether odysseus is dead or alive so he wants to know for certain because regardless if he gives penelope back to her dad acarius he has to give back the dowry and that is going to cost him a lot of money and he highlights that and he says i don't want to have to deal with those expenses right now and not only that but a third and final one wonderful point that he says is that if he sends his mother back she's probably gonna be hella pissed right because she's gonna be like my own son sent me back to my father to get remarried because he didn't even want to handle me so she's gonna be mad and she's probably gonna pray down to the underworld gods and she's gonna be like hey you need to go and torment my son and guess who's gonna appear the furies and guess who doesn't want to handle the furies telemachus and he literally says that to all of them he's just like i really don't want to have to deal with that right now but he does say to all the suitors again that they should be so embarrassed by their actions and the fact that they're having this conversation anyway so they should all want to leave he says if you guys even had any ounce of manners any ounce of hospitality yourselves you would leave however if they don't leave he reiterates that he's going to pray to zeus to ensure that he doesn't have any repercussions if he decides to come back and to punish the suitors in the house and he says that uh, you know you can stay at your own risk once again he keeps making this point and it's important that i highlight that in this video because the end of the book should then not be a shock to anybody. <laughs> That's why it's highlighted right now, because he's like, well, I told them, and we all read multiple times, all the times that I told them that I'm going to try and kill them the best that I can. After he says this though, before anybody else can pipe up, that Zeus hears the prayer, obviously he does. So Zeus hears the prayer and he sends down two eagles from this high mountain point 
thing. And they all fly down over the meeting that's happening. They all swoosh down with their like talons out and everything. So everybody's a bit like, oh my God. Giant eagles are swerving over all of them. And then they go through the houses and through the city and everybody just sort of watches them as they fly off, right? And as we all know, because you guys are now regulars on Moaning, and if you don't, then welcome. Eagles are a sign of Zeus, right? So that's a very important omen that just happened. And there's never really a time in mythology where eagles just appear out of nowhere. It's usually because Zeus is like, I hear you, here's the bird to solidify that I have heard your prayer. For any new readers of mythology though, we have this character called Halitherses. I literally had to write it down and it is spelled H-A-L-I-T-H-E-R-S-E-S. <laughs> um, I, as we all know, I'm terrible with pronunciation. I think it's Halitherses. Not sure I'm gonna say it probably differently every single time I say it, but he then stands up because he apparently is a really good reader of bird omens. That's like his job in the ancient world. He reads the bird omen correctly and he says that this is a sign from Zeus that if the suitors decide to stay, then they are going to bring about their own destruction and it's going to be really rough for all of them. The birds, according to him, are clearly a sign that Odysseus is not far off from Ithaca and that when he comes home, he's gonna deal with the suitors. So he says that now is the time for for all of them to put their heads together and to figure out how to get the suitors out of the palace before Odysseus comes home because it's inevitable according to this amazing bird reader. Like literally it's noted that he like outperformed everybody in the field of bird re bird omen reading. Our little bird reader also then says that he will come home and when he comes home he's gonna be hella mad if none of them stand up and say anything. That's what he says. He says if none of us get up and do anything right now if Odysseus comes home and he finds out that we've all just been hanging about doing Cool, letting the suitors torment his son and his wife, he's probably going to kill us too. He says this actually because he's pretty certain that Odysseus is gonna come home, not only because of this bird omen, but also because there was a prophecy before Odysseus left for Troy that said that it will take him a really long time to get home, but when he does, he will return unrecognized by all, and that's the key, because Halitherses, whatever his name is, that he says he could literally come at any point and we won't know, so we have to put our heads together now and try to help Penelope and Telemachus get this shit together. When he's finished speaking, my favorite speaker of the whole meeting stands up, and his name is Eurymachus, and he stands up and literally looks at Halitherses, and he says, shut the f up. <laughs> he just straight up tells this man to go home and to babble all this crap to his family because he says, why does every bird have to be sent from the gods? Sometimes a bird is just a bird. In fact, the exact quote is not all birds who flutter under the sun are subjects of omens. And I love that line because no one said it. Even in the Iliad, they sometimes will argue about bird omens, about what they mean, but not if the bird is an omen. And this guy is just straight up saying, what if they're just eagles? Don't be ridiculous. He also says that he wishes that Halitherses, Halitherses was also dead, just like Odysseus, because that way they would all be free of his droning, boring prophecies that they've all had to handle for the last however many years. But then he finishes off his little speech by basically saying what we've heard from everybody else, which is just that the suitors are not gonna leave until Penelope is married off, and or if Penelope is then sent back to her father. So we just get this whole point reiterated again that they are not budging from the palace because they're rude as Telemachus then stands up and he just says, look guys, I'm not gonna argue with you guys anymore. This is utterly ridiculous. This is just going in circles. He wants to get his ship together with all of his men. Cause if we remember from book one, that's what Athena told him to do. So he says that he's gonna do that. And he reiterates exactly what they've said in book one, which is that he's going to load up this ship with 20 oarsmen. He's gonna go to Pylos. He's then gonna go to Sparta. If he hears of Odysseus being alive, he's gonna come back and wait it out a year. But if he hears of Odysseus being dead, he's going to come back. He's going to perform the correct burial rites for his father. And then he is going to kill all the suitors. That's what he says. And when he sits down, this guy Mentor stands up. So Mentor is a really old friend of Odysseus's uh, from like way back in the day. And Mentor says to the whole assembly that actually he doesn't blame the suitors for acting the way that they do because they believe that Odysseus is dead. So he says, based on the idea that they think Odysseus is dead, of course they're acting the way that they are because they don't believe that there's any repercussions. But if anybody else in this assembly believes that Odysseus is alive, he's more mad at them. Mentor's more mad and more upset with those people because he says that why wouldn't you be acting for Odysseus and trying to help his family against these suitors if you believe that he's alive? Obviously they're acting rude. They think he's dead. They think that he's not gonna come back and kill him. If you think he is, then help. Now the last guy finally gets up to speak in this assembly and he basically tells Mentor that he's a fool. He's like, you're a fool for saying all of that. I'm just expect I don't know why I had to act that out for you guys as well. But either way, that's what he says to Mentor. And then he tells everybody that this is just a stupid argument. And he says that Odysseus would be stupid to try and come back and have like a one man army against the rest of the suitors. That would be utterly ridiculous. He then goes through a bunch of different other points, which are not really all that important for this video. But he just tells all of them that this is going nowhere, that they should all go home and they should all just, you know, hang out in the palace or whatever it is. Go about their day, basically is what he says. So 
the assembly splits up and everybody decides to go their separate ways. The men who are not suitors go back home, the men who are the suitors just go back to the palace. Telemachus though, he goes to walk along the beach because he needs some time to think. So he's just walking along the beach, he's like washing his hands in the ocean and all of this, and Athena decides to come down and to talk to him to give him some more nudging <laughs> and some more instructions of what to do. So she comes down, she takes on the form of mentor, and by the way, Athena taking on the form of mentor and helping Telemachus is where we get the word mentor from nowadays. It comes from this character and how Athena is telling him what to do and helping him along on his journey. Ultimately Telemachus does the whole thing, but the fact that she is taking on the name mentor is where we get it from, which is like a fun little pop culture fact and you guys know that I love doing that on this channel. Athena comes down and tells Telemachus that actually no man, unless they were the son of Odysseus, could carry out the journey that he is intending to carry out to Pelos and to Sparta. And now she's really just gonna give him instructions, right? So she, you know, flatters him a little bit so that he feels comfortable. But she tells him to go home, to pack up all this wine, to pack up all of like the food that they're gonna need on board and not to tell anybody. She's like, really, you should keep this to yourself of what you're doing, but go home, do that. And she says as mentor, right, bear in mind, he doesn't know that it's Athena, but she says that she's gonna go and find like a hull crew and a ship for him because they don't have a ship, right? So she's like, I'm gonna go find the ship. I'm gonna go find the men. You handle all the stuff that you have to bring on board. And Telemachus is like, cool. And so he goes back to the palace and Athena goes walking through the town. Now, when he goes back to the palace, all of the suitors are obviously like killing all of his sheep and garrets and singeing pigs and eating all of his crap and, and drinking all of his wine as they have been the whole time as if they didn't just have a public meeting about it, but whatever. So he goes back in and Antinous, one of the guys who spoke, he comes up to him and like grabs his hand and basically says that he needs to put aside his pride. He's like, Telemachus, get the f over it, man. Like, just come eat with us. It'll be like old times, like right in the beginning when we came, it will be like a really good time. Just come and drink with us. And Telemachus obviously just kind of like removes <laughs> his hand from Antinous as he's like, oh no, that's a little bit too close for comfort. And says they've been being rude to him for the last how many years? He says, how do you expect me to put all of that aside, to put all of your misbehavior aside and for me to just come and sit with you and laugh and have a good time and drink with you? He literally calls them ruffians. <laughs> I love that. He sounds like an old man. He's like, you guys are ruffians. I'm not sitting with you. And he says that he's still going to go off to Sparta and to Pelos. So he has lots of things to prepare for that because he will stop at nothing to destroy the suitors. So as he walks away from Antinous though, he's got to walk through all of the other suitors, right? And all of them just start yelling at him. One of them even says, oh, he's only going to Pelos into Sparta to find Hitman to come back and kill us. One of them says that he's gonna go to Africa on his journey, really, and he's just lying about Pelos and Sparta. And he's actually gonna go and find poison to then slip in all of their foods. And Telemachus, rightfully so, he just ignores them as they're all sort of like taunting him and trying to get a reaction out of him. And he just goes straight down to the storeroom. Now the storeroom in the basement of the palace is usually guarded by a uh, house maiden, which is obviously Eurycleia, right? So Eurycleia normally is the one to make sure that no one goes into this storeroom. And this is just keeping things for when Odysseus comes home. So there's, you know, wine in there and um, barley, or barley meal is what they call it. So like lots of barley meal is in there. And that is what Telemachus needs for his journey. So when he goes in, he tells Eurycleia the plan, but he also tells her, like not to tell anybody else, he's like, this is a secret between me and you. So he then gets some of the wine out and he wants to parcel it into like travel size jars. So he asks her to help him in putting uh, all of the wine into 20. No, I meant 12, not 20, <laughs> into 12 little jars. And then to put some of the barley into these leather sacks to get a bunch of those filled up. Uh, so that he can take them on his journey. And obviously Eurycleia is like not okay with this whole plan. And she is just like, what madness has come over you young prince? Why are you going out to sea? She believes that Odysseus has died at sea. So she thinks that the same thing is gonna happen to Salamicus, obviously. So she is not having a good time with this piece of news. And the fact that she can't talk about it to anybody else, it's going to eat Eurycleia alive. But Salamicus tries to reassure her and tells her that he's gonna do it anyways, and that he's totally safe and he feels like he can do it and he just needs to hear word of his father. But he says that he really doesn't want Penelope to worry so he's like look why don't you like not mention anything to my mother until like 10 or 12 days just wait until i've been gone 10 or 12 days she won't even notice until that point and then you can tell her that i've gone and you read that just like you think your mother penelope is not going to notice you're not home <laughs> like what is your reply gonna say oh he's just out with his mates they're out walking around the town or like oh he's staying at this girl's that he's hooking up with like i don't think that penelope's gonna believe that for a full 10 12 days but either way telemachus that is what he says to her and then he also says to her in this moment he then is like by the way back to business <laughs> uh you should also leave one jar of wine for odysseus in case he comes back as telemachus is gone because he's like we don't want to have all of the wine to us and not have anything for him if he comes home and so you're 
is like fine, but she's also like crying and she can't handle this. Meanwhile, Athena has been walking through the town and she ends up getting together all of his crew. She ends up borrowing a boat off of this guy who she literally has to ask, can I use your boat? And the guy's like, yeah, sure, I don't really give a shit. So she then takes the boat down to the beach uh, she then gets all of the men to gather down the beach and then she goes to find Telemachus as mentor, obviously. And she tells him, we've got everything ready. You should probably get down to the beach so that we can leave tonight. Uh, and again, let's not tell anybody because that's like a bad idea. So let's go now. So then Telemachus goes down to the beach with her. He then meets all of the guys who are down there and he's like, great, let's all get on the boat. And Athena then helps with like sending this little ruffle of wind onto the sea. And so then the boat can go because all the men start with like a mast and all of the sails and everything's like blowing in the wind. And then they go off and they sail into the night. That was a really fast ending to the book um, but that's essentially what happens nothing really interesting conversationally happens at that point but um yeah they're gonna go find Odysseus and the first stop is Pelos but that is the end of book two always excited to get to the end of the book because these episodes are getting longer and longer and longer but thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll be seeing you next time for book three of Homer's Odyssey we'll be seeing you guys then Bye.